welcome to this online panel. Um, I'm Lorenzo. I'm from the family. Uh, if you don't know the family, we're, uh, we're founders uh, from all over Europe. Um, we used to be quite offline based, but given the circumstances, we're making a big switch to, to online. I recommend you check our, our websites to uh, see all the agenda um, that we have planned. We have daily events now uh, online. Uh, and I'm joined by uh, Erwan and Ben. Um, I'll let you guys introduce yourself, Erwan. Hi. Yes. Hi, everybody. I'm Erwan Kezar, and I set up um, Contournement uh, last September in Paris. Uh, that's um, a company where we train people on no-code tools so that they can kickstart their projects. And uh, we also uh, make a community around no-code in France and events, webinars, that all. Face-to-face uh, -face events and trainings, but also now online trainings. <laughs> Everyone's doing online now. Exactly. And what about you, Ben? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ben, the founder of Makerpad. Um, we do much the same as Erwan does, but not in French. We have a platform of tutorials, online boot camps, workshops, a community. Um, yeah, we teach people how to build stuff without code, whether that's B2C or B2B. All right, I put the, all the links in the chat. So if you wanna, if you guys wanna check it out, um, I think we can just uh, kick things off um, with with you, Ben. Uh, I know that um, you've been in you've been into no code and looking at things up uh, for a while now. Um, so I imagine when you started uh, sort of exploring no code, there wasn't much of a of a community. There wasn't a makeup out of sorts at the time. So I was wondering, sort of, how did you do it? How did you do learn? How do you teach yourself to, to use no code tools? Yeah, I mean, no code when I was starting a few years ago wasn't it wasn't like a thing that I was choosing to do because it was like a popular thing that people were talking about. It was just I couldn't code. So I didn't have a technical co founder and I didn't know how to code. And everyone So it was you started off to found your own company? Well, I just wanted to like launch ideas. I was working at Product Hunt and I was a victim of my own surroundings where people are launching stuff all the time, like thousands of projects all every week. Um, and I always thought, oh yeah, one day I'll launch a company and I'll have hundreds of employees and I'll be a big time CEO. So I knew at one point I'd try and launch something, but I never knew what that idea would be. Um, so I just wanted to test them and test them quickly. So the idea of spending a year learning to code or finding a technical co-founder and trying to like convince them that my idea was the next best thing. Like neither of those seemed feasible and rightly so because I didn't know what was going to work. Um, and I just like wanted to spin something up, not spend months on it. So I just like found some of these tools, like you type form and card and, and like stitch things together to make them look like they were real real projects um and like people kept on being interested in what i was doing and following along and so i i think i sort of had a false sense of okay so people like my ideas whereas what they were actually interested in was how i was doing it without code so there was like a natural community of people following me who saw that i couldn't code saw that i didn't have a technical co-founder and i was like launching stuff so people were like drawn to that a bit on Twitter mostly, I think. Um, and that's where that's where sort of the organic community came from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and to sort of learn and troubleshoot and problem solve, um, I'm guessing it was more of the community of the tools that you were using? No, I'm one of those who doesn't read the instruction manual. I don't like ask anyone. I just dive in, break it, and then figure it out myself. Um, I'm quite naturally curious with tech. So yeah. I was just like, I'm going to make this work. I'll figure out if there's like one or two things I need to ask, I'll just ping on Twitter. So yeah, I mean, I'm not good in forums and things like that, but like- No, I but your, your Twitter game is very strong. <laughs> well, I don't know that there's a real game going on. I just tweet stuff 
Sometimes it's like yeah. too much. Sometimes it's far too little. I don't know what the strategy is. It just it comes out on my keyboard, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Oh, right. I feel like there's certainly a type of people that have a a way of sort of presenting information and 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 speaking to a community that that works well on Twitter. Well, yeah. I mean, you're always you're always popping up on my timeline. So <laughs> yeah, well, the, you you have to be doing something right. Yeah, I mean, like I said, it's it's not. It's more of an extension of myself and how I yeah. react. So it helps that it's not a strategy that I'm trying to stick to because otherwise I'd never be able to do it. So I think, yeah. I mean, I'm lucky in the fact that, that like people follow me and seemingly are interested in what I'm talking about. So yeah, that's a bonus for me. Yeah, that's cool. That's very cool. And uh, and and you are one. I know that you co-founded a uh, coding bootcamp before yes. before Contournement. Um, yeah. So. So the natural question I'm asking is, why did you make the switch, and and what's what's different about about these boot camps? No, back in the days in 2013, when I got the idea of Simplon, that was because um, with one of my co-founder, we we had discovered uh, texts texts like Ruby on Rails that had for uh, for advantage to make you to you know, enable you to build things faster, you know, to prototype faster. We didn't set up this bootcamp for for the love of technique. That was to empower people, notably people who had no job, to build things, to make things. And uh, you know that's the natural continuity uh, with no code. What we're doing now with Contournement, because uh, you know, ten years ago, you needed. No, oh. did you did you lose them too? Yes. I lost it. Oh, it seems like we lo we lost our one. <laughs> all right, sorry guys. Uh, all right, let's just let's just move on and wait to see if one can join us again. Um, so, to go back to MakerPad, um, who who's the persona that 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 you're trying to um, reach? Who's who's the person that um, would benefit the most from from MakerPad and using their code source? Today? So I think there's a natural draw from people who are trying to build things so makers um like <laughs> firing founders yeah that's what i was thinking louis um <laughs> firing founders like yeah people who want to be entrepreneurs sort of it lends themselves naturally to this type of platform where you're showing how to do something or you're now empowered to build something without needing to code um it's not like necessarily the persona we're after we're not like going for that persona because mm. for me and we can probably get into this a bit later is no code as a community like is fine what we're trying to do is just show that 99 percent of people you can do the thing you're probably thinking of doing at work but without needing to code it's not necessarily like you're a no code maker you can spin up a airbnb clone for no coders like all the time, like it's not just that sort of circle. Um, we want to just be able to show people in work, in companies that they can automate things, they can build new features, they can be more productive with mm. the use of no code. So that is a very difficult persona necessarily because it's it's like it's so many things at once. And obviously the sort of standard advice is focus on one specific use case or persona um but i don't think i think no code is difficult to, to do that with yeah for sure i mean the way the way i see it it's like the really today three large use cases that you can have it's either you're trying to build something from scratch and found your own company uh, or you're trying to sort of automate internal processes and you're more of an employee or manager um, and then there's the then there's the sort of more passion economy one man company type of 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 use. Um, yeah, so, yeah. I mean, there are definitely the three types we see. It's like the no code maker. They want to build things. There's like and whether that's to be an entrepreneur founder or whether it's just to be like a no code tinkerer maker. There's the mm -hmm. uh, professional at work who wants to automate the repetitive tasks and and allow themselves to be more creative. And then there's like the freelancer agency, uh, one person businesses who maybe have done web design or offer that. And then they're like, Oh wait, I can actually now build 
actual products. I can build automations, yeah. and I can also automate my own work. Hmm. Yeah, no, no, and, and that, that that brings me to the other point that I wanted to bring up is sort of um, no code tools sort of give you empower people with certain skills about design, but I, I so like just um, and thinking about. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I can hear oh. you. Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. Um, so, the, so I think design skills certainly with something like like Webflow can help you actually ship your products and not depend on the on the engineering team. But do you think there's other sort of skills that are specifically are, are yeah are specifically inclined to be empowered by no code tools? I think it's the probably the people who are naturally like naturally curious. I think helps because you you see past. The use case that is presented in front of you. So if I say yeah. you can like you can automate this service to enable gift cards like to be automatically emailed to you, some people would just see that as okay, that's how I make a gift card system. But actually, mm -hmm. you could think, oh wait, I can use that exact same thing to create different sales templates. I can use that to create different invoices for people who rent in de like details. So. Yeah. People like that, it's like, yeah, it's, you need to push past Have the, the logic for yeah. automation. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally and, agree. And, and just try and push things maybe where they're not supposed to go. Like, what can you do further? Um, uh -huh. yeah. I don't know, it makes, it makes sort of sense. Elwan, I'm glad you're back with us. Can you hear us? Yes, I'm, I'm also very glad. <laughs> so, so, someone was saying in the chat is because you talked about coding that you got kicked out. <laughs> yeah, I think so, yeah. <laughs> So, so take us back um, to what you were saying about coding and, and trying to make it easier for people to build products. Exactly, you know, um, nowadays you want to kickstart your project, you know code. If you want to get a job uh, into programming, yes, uh, learn how to code and learn how to code well. But if you want just to, yeah, to, to bootstrap a project to make, to make your MVP, to build your your prototype, mm -hmm. just no code. There are some things, there are some limits to no code, but globally, if you really have the Lean Startup approach yeah. and want to test something, just no code. But there is something interesting in that, you know, back in the days, the Ruby on Rails community kind of looked like what the no code community uh, is today. You know, uh, like the part, the entrepreneurial part of the community around David Hanson, Heine Mayer, 37 Signals, there was, uh, this interest for technique, but mainly for how to build and, and launch things, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's the main difference between the developer community and the no-code community, I think, is that experts are not the only ones you, you listen to, you know? Uh, there is um, much pragmatism, much entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial insights that are very valuable in uh, the no-code community, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah f for sure. And from what, what you were saying about if today you wanted to start a company, I think the the 80 20 sort of 80 80 percent of functionality for 20 percent of the of the cost and, and, and time uh, yeah. is a is a good way of, of thinking about it if you're evaluating it for sure. Um, exactly, for convention sure. of our configuration uh, yeah. principle is really really efficient with no code. Uh -huh. Yeah. So um, and but so you you. Today, the no-code community is quite strong and quite active. Um, I think um, whenever I have an issue and I post it on the different channels that I'm in, uh, I usually get answers quite fast. Um, and it, it, it can sort of trick you into thinking that it's it's bigger than it is. Uh, but when you sort of step outside of that s small circle, uh, you realize that no one understands what's going on. Um, I, I, one of my thoughts is that it's, actually the name no code that is confusing um, I wonder if you have any any takes on that I think I think it's quite limiting in terms of it makes you think that you, it's just people trying to get around code where to me it's just a different approach to building products of thinking of products mm -hmm. as more of blocks that you stack rather than a house you build from from zero um, from raw materials um, do you have any thoughts on that um, do you want to begin, Ben, or there you go. I, do? I think the no-code word can be tricky because 
no code doesn't mean that it's easy you know it's more accessible you don't have the barrier of the of the code but you have to master some basic concepts of programming because you're not coding but you're programming you're building things you're developing things you're no code developing things and um first of all yeah uh this word is interesting because it says what it what you don't have to do you don't have to code but it doesn't really say what you can do you know you program visually you i like this word if it means no need you need no code to build but if it only says yeah there is no more barrier i think that can be tricky but in terms of communication it's it's um an appealing word so many people say no code what do you mean by this but i think it's useful in that sense but there is a big warning uh, we, we like to put in contournement because you know we were on tv in the media and people no code does it mean that there will no be no more programmers <laughs> Each time you say, no, 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 no. One day there will be some beginners who come in the community and say, yeah, we are no coders, uh, programmers are dead. No, 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 no. Uh, what Vlad Magdalin of Webflow says uh, said um, in San Francisco in the NoteCode conference, no code conference, he said, no code is 100 more chances than for projects to succeed because many people launch projects. So we will need 100 more more uh, 100 times more developers because yeah. no code has limits and we have many examples of this but... and there's yeah, a very think... good thread on uh, twitter on uh, ben's twitter about this about the term no code and uh, i recommend to read it <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'll, I'll do a short version now um <laughs> so i yeah i mean i, I agree with everything everyone says um it's it's strange that no code the term is like the term of a movement because it seems to be strange that a negative is like this empowering movement it starts with a negative there is code written it's just we haven't written that code it's just an abstraction of what you're building um so it is a bit confusing and yeah we're going to meet need more developers than ever to build these tools and do other things and there's always some limits so this like web uh, makeupad has some custom scripts that I haven't coded, I've copied and pasted them, but I mean, I get like, there's still some level of crossover. And I actually think that no coding, using no code to build stuff is probably the best first step into learning to code that there is. Because once you do that, exactly. um, yeah, once you do that once, like for me, an example is I've built Makerpad all on no code. There's some custom scripts which do a few things. I then start, I then start understanding why certain things in that script do certain other things. And then if I use Zapier for the webhooks, like talking to an API, I then understand, oh, okay, that's how an API is working because that's talking to that and that's talking to that. So no code as a term is confusing, but it's reached the people who have been told you have to learn to code or find a technical developer. So they've sort of identified with that really quickly and thought I built this with no code. like the way I used to tweet about it, I looked back to see what I used to call it when I first started it. I just said I did this without writing any code, but it's just too many words to be a catch. Mm -hmm. So, mm. I mean, that's what it is. And I, and someone else after I did that um, thread was just like, do we even like give a shit what it's called? Like, <laughs> it's just, if that's what it's called, that's sort of what it's called. Um, like we're not trying to change it. We can't, you can't change it unless everyone starts agreeing and we do like a committee and we all sign a, a, an agreement. Like we just leave it as it is. And, and as long as there's some education around what different people and different companies feel about the, the, the underlying sort of movement, then hopefully we can get that out and doing things like this is more, uh, mm. more power to that. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's exactly what, um, Lewis is saying in the chat right now is you learn the basics of, of code and the hacker mindset a lot and yes. it, it, it's exactly the same for me I mean um, and that's something that also I also wanted to talk about is of course you I think you you both cover code at some point in the content that you produce um, and you don't at all Owen no we don't teach code at all not but, not even um, like uh, APIs or a bit of JavaScript no no only maybe iframes <laughs> embedding <laughs> but what we do in our training is really explaining um where 
code can be useful where there okay. are the limits of no code, but really, really train people on programming. You know what? If I had today to set up a new bootcamp, a new coding bootcamp, I would begin by, for the front end part, two weeks of Webflow because you understand the CSS box model and all. And mm -hmm. um, I don't know, maybe two weeks of bubble up your air table, air table to understand what a database is. Uh, what a view is, how it works. It's so abstract when you learn coding. First, you have to learn the abstraction of the language and then of the system, of the bricks. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but we don't um, teach code at all, but we explain um, how um, the br those bricks works, uh, work and on which bricks you may need code, uh, on what you can't do with no code, for example. Yeah, I think we we don't teach code because I cannot teach code because I have no idea how to do it. Okay. So, like, the only things I can do is whatever I've discovered from no coding, which is, oh, yeah, this Zapier action is now sending this thing to the Webflow API. Or maybe there's, like, I've now done a patch webhook. And that's as technical as I can get. We have a company on our platform called Standard Library who have a platform that allows you to write things without code, but then it like and generates the code for you, but in plain sight. Whereas other tools sort of do it in the background. This one does it in plain sight to really help you teach, like teach yourself basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. they're just in like crossovers there, but yeah, we don't teach yeah. either. Yeah, yeah. That's a very interesting point, what you say, because to teach oneself, you know, in the developer mindset, the RTA, RTFM mindset, read the flaming manual. Don't ask me, uh, teach yourself, learn how to learn, uh, search, test. That's something very important in the community of developers as in the work of a developer. That's a very important, very strong common point, very strong similarity, I think. Uh, heritage maybe because guys who, who develop no code tools, they are tech people. So I think this culture is here notably thanks to this. And my co-founder, Alexi, is um, in Contournement, is a very experienced developer. And um, and I think that's something that is very useful, you know, when we teach it. If you can really master something, you can explain it simply. And with no code, you can explain it four times faster, yeah. you know? Yeah, for sure. I think, yeah, it's like that point is, is what I've said on numerous podcasts I've been on, which is, like I still have the same issues as a as a coder does. Like I have to set something up, test it. It fails or something breaks. I got to go through and like debug it. I got to troubleshoot. I've got to do my Zapier test and see what goes through. There's like there's a certain level of of the same blocks of okay. I've built this thing. Like Webflow is my front end. Airtable is my back end. Zapier connects everything together. Where's this going wrong? Where does it not quite fit? Test, test, test. Okay, that works. Okay, now a customer's done something stupid, and now I've got to fix it all again. It's like the same. We go through the same struggles as a lot of developers I hear uh, go through as well. So, yeah, for sure, for sure. And so, it, so you you started talking about about different um, tools just now, and I know that today, I think basically there's one sort of stack that's emerging above everything else, which is uh, the Airtable, Webflow, Zapier. Um, but on the other side, you have platforms that are trying to do all in one, like a bubble, or I know in the chat, Tomika was talking about a uh, Mendix. I don't, I, I've never heard of it, but you, I assume you guys know it. Rather low code, but yeah. It's like low code enterprise corporate. Okay. Do, do, do you guys have any preference between the two? Is it just a matter of use case? What's, what's the deal here? I don't know if we're going to say the same answer, but I have got a feeling that we might. Um, the all-in-one tools are great, and I think it's just like a style of using tools. Like, just because one tool has everything doesn't mean you prefer that over another one. I like, for me, I like the control I have over everything in Webflow. I get the best of Webflow out of Webflow. And then with Airtable, it's a spreadsheet like as I can see and recognize a spreadsheet, I really understand how that works and how I can like move this one thing here and it just does this one thing here. Zapier then allows me to have control over each and every point. I can see everything go through and it's very like transparent in my whole stack is that 
I know where everything is at certain points, how it flows through everything. And an all-in-one solution is great. And some people, like they often have a, a, a bigger learning curve. Like Emmanuel from Bubble, um, he says the same. He says to me that like, yeah, we pride ourselves on having five to 10 hours of, of learning before you actually will get a bubble. But once you do, you could build anything, which is completely true. Like I'm not not vouching for bubble when I'm saying I like Webflow, Airtable, and Zapier. That's just what I like using. I know how to build the things really quickly. And yeah, there is a limit, but that's just what, what I like to do. In, at Contournement, we don't have any preferences. Uh, the integrate approach, integrated approach or modular approach can be are different. Uh, sometimes we find the modular approach more exciting, more creative. And not only with the um, Airtable, Webflow, uh, Zapier um, uh, stack, stack, for example. Yeah, yeah, because the, those are stacks, really, like development, web development. You know, uh, for, for four days, I've been developing uh, an application for um, an association that works uh, in the ghetto you know, in France uh, against the, um, the epidemic. And I hoped um, maybe Webflow, and I, I chose a stack I had never used, Glide plus Airtable. And that was so exciting. It went so, it went so fast. And um, maybe with another stack, I would have been blocked and stopped. Uh, but what I have to say is that, for example, I have a use case that is interesting. You now we have a training that's called uh, Side Project that's on eight weeks. And people learn one, one uh, evening a week how to build their MVP. And we had a student who wanted to make an app, uh, a mobile app. And when we saw how she learned, but also how we could um, technically pivot her project, we just said, no, we won't do it with Bubble finally. We will do it with Typeform plus Bubble plus um, SendGrid plus uh, Stripe to send personalized uh, emails, uh, newsletters, like you can find on Substack and all. And that was very interesting, you know. Uh, in Bubble, she felt the power of the tool, but with um, the um, modular approach, with the stack with different tools, she understood better because she was who she was. You know, there are some other students who who prefer Bubble. Yeah, I think my mind works in a certain way that, like, that's why learning to code was difficult for me because I was just like, well, I don't understand, I can't process the semicolons and and typing things out that way but i can understand clicking and dragging and doing things that way so some mm -hmm. tools bend themselves better to what i'm doing but similarly to, to oh and i like i was trying to build something to help in this whole um this whole crisis and built a an app for restaurant owners to do sort of allow themselves to do takeaways and i used glide i built it in bed on saturday morning within an hour I put it out there and yes, yeah, I had like 4,000 people have used it and like 100,000 people have seen it. So it actually took me an hour. I don't choose Glide every time. I don't choose Webflow every time. It's just like there's different projects, different use cases. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you'd like just mixing it up and seeing what, seeing how you can yeah. push things or how you can connect things. It's just like an, an interest thing, right? It's, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's tons of tools. We could be there all day trying them all. What can be very exciting is knowing all the tools uh, going forward with the frontier, you know, of all this far west community of no code. There are many tools appearing, many features. Glide, you know, every two weeks uh, there is a new feature, Adalo also. And, you know, you, you see connections between them. You say, oh, with the JIC stack, for example, Glide, uh, Integromat, uh, Card uh, stack, I could do this. Oh, <laughs> you know, that's, that's what is interesting. I definitely get those thoughts at night. <laughs> uh, and so, and, and continuing on that point, uh, Louis was asking about the what's missing in the in the stacks today. Is there a critical piece of no code that's the stack that's missing? There needs to be a. This is just one request. If anyone's out there want to build it, um, it's basically for to allow, allow Stripe Connect to be integrated into some of these apps really easily. A lot of people want to build mm -hmm. platforms which I can go on another, like, talk about myself. But if someone wants to build a platform and have a split payment of X percent goes to the platform, X percent goes to the 
the person ordering whatever. Um, so there's mm-hmm. things like there's there's a, a lot of little, seemingly little like add-ons that could be built to help with certain. Mm-hmm. So that's where like member stack came in and member space. They saw an opportunity to create like the memberships piece. It was like a very highly um, sought after feature on the Webflow, WordPress, CMO, or whatever they were, like the wish lists and Webflow are like, yeah, we'll get to it, mm. but we just can't right now. So someone just comes along, yeah. builds a small feature and, and, and like spins it out. And yeah, they've been great, but I don't know a big, like, obviously there could be one huge platform that does web apps really well and it looks amazing and it works really well for me and and also you just one click and it's a mobile app as well and and all that sort of stuff but i don't know like i only ever build for a use case that i see in front of me and i don't know whether this is my nature but i always figure out a way around something or like i figure out a hacky way to do it and I just don't know what I don't know. So until someone comes along and says, this is what you were trying to look for, you idiot, this is the mm-hmm. thing, then mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I just figure it out myself with other tools. And just to, just to add, because uh, Tomika is asking in the chat, um, I think what Ben meant was really integrating the, the payments a part of, of, of an app, uh, of making Stripe easier to integrate into different tools. That's yeah, it's, it's, it is what Tomika is saying. It's, and allowing Stripe to enable a marketplace. So Stripe, you can enable a bunch of ways now, which we do a ton of different ways, but the one piece missing for me, not for anything in particular, but for like some tutorials and stuff is creating a marketplace and having those payments work that way with, with no mm-hmm. code. Um, yeah. Cool. I want you have a wish. Yes, too. I think there is uh, the part. I think we are expect we are all expecting the the next version e-commerce version of Webflow. You know, as a e-commerce tool, I often train you know entrepreneurs who have uh, many technical needs, and when they have an e-commerce platform, you know, Shopify is interesting because you go you can go very fast, but that's kind of uh, the older WordPress. You can't do exactly what you want. That's not exactly WYSIWYG. Um, you know, I think there is a place for a real e-commerce tool on no-code, I think. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, because Webflow, if you really want to make e-commerce, you have to hack it and even maybe to, to code a bit. And, uh, and also on the mobile, because we would like a killer app, a killer tool to do as well on the mobile as you can do on the web today. I think Adalo is one of the most promising um, tool on this because that's really for mobile, you know? Even if you want to publish on the App Store, it's not, that's frictionless. That's not even frictionless. That's a pleasure to publish on the App Store, I say it. <laughs> yeah, even if that can be, a, a, it can suffer when you do this normally. And um, But on mobile, I think there is still uh, something to do. Yeah, yeah I agree. Yeah. And because I just want to add a wish, uh, I think I, I like what member stack is doing, but they're focused on, on passwords, email and password combinations, which to me is a no, whole nother, the no password movement should be much bigger, um, because I think passwords are, are, are a pain in the ass for everyone. Um, and making it with a uh, Google connect or, uh, Apple sign in, uh, or Slack sign in, whatever. Uh, but making it passwordless uh, with no code. I mean, I, ma- I managed to build it with Firebase and and a bunch of web mm. ho- web hooks and SDKs, and it was a pain to build. Uh, but it works, so it technically is possible. Um, I just think either member section have a, a Google Connect option, um, or someone should build it. Um, yeah. And you can you can then manage your yeah. user base from an Airtable, like the way we do it for our community. Uh, Airtable is our backend for everything, and if I add an email to a if I add a line with an email in my Airtable, then that person can enter with that email address on uh, that phone. So yeah, think... there's, there's, have you seen Fast.co who are doing this? Yeah, like, I love them. Checkouts. Yeah. That'll be awesome. He's another yeah. one. He's another one that has a really good Twitter game. <laughs> yeah, Dom's great. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think if we're going to wishes, I'll try not to carry on. But it's yeah, <laughs> no, there needs to be like a, ideas to people. Yeah, the the login stuff is interesting where like we've got slack 
because people just like talking to Slack. It's so easy. You can chat whenever. So trying to move a Slack community to a like a forum like Discourse. We've got a forum on Discourse. We've got our mm. member stack login on on MakerPad, which I I make sure that no one ever has to re-log in as long as you don't like if you log in you're in. So don't worry about that. But it's like there's three logins there and there's no easy like single sign on. You can't just say okay if this person is in my member stack like log in then just let them sign into that. So yeah, to try and connect things and just say integrate mm. Slack as well, integrate this, and then everything would just be one mm. thing would be a, a great solution. And I think uh, another wish, another wish, because I think that's a bit the next move of no coding. I, I hope so. You know, generally, many tools just mimic uh, how you traditionally um, web program. You know, but some tools like Glide with a very strong, um, uh, I don't know, vision of, uh, of no coding, you know, Glide, that's very powerful, that's very limited, but it can cover so many use cases with a, f uh, a flaming Google sheet, a very simple Google sheet. You know, that's a very strong vision of no coding. And I think, I hope there will be more tools uh, that have uh, that kind of, um, of bet, you know. I do some things, not everything, but some things, uh, in a very particular way and a very user-friendly uh, way. Yeah, know? I think. That, uh, yeah, there should there should definitely be a glide for web, like web threads yeah. and apps for sure. I don't see why there yeah. couldn't be. I mean, I'm not gonna devalue glide and just say why not someone copy paste that into their web, but like it's definitely doable. Yeah. So yeah, it'd be uh, it'd be awesome to see that too. See, I'm already having a call tomorrow to discuss an idea. <laughs> I think I think with the, the people that are listening now, we have, we have some people have time on their hands for the coming weeks. They should be working on on stuff that can help us. <laughs> exactly. Um, all right, let's go back to to just the education part. Um, I was wondering, in terms of formats, I know. I mean, we're all doing online only now. Um, we're kind of forced to. Uh, I think it's a good thing, but it's just the circumstances. Um, I know you, Ben, at MakerPad, you have webinars and boot camps and written tutorials and video tutorials. You sort of tried everything in terms of formats. Um, I was wondering if you have any insights into sort of what works best. I imagine it's a bit of everything, uh, but what, what have you learned on that side? Yeah, so, I mean, I started MakerPad with just doing video tutorials. They didn't even have any audio or my face on it or anything. It was just like a video and text. Um, so we just carried on down that path for a long time and did ended up doing audio on the on the videos and things. So mm -hmm. people like the tutorials. Um, the one thing I've got a problem with is people want to find that specific tutorial at the right time that they're looking for that specific solution. And if they don't, then like we all know that users don't tend to search around too much necessarily. They're not like curious curiously looking through the site to find the one thing. So sometimes the right tutorial won't present itself to them and then mm. it's not a good experience. So what we're looking at is more of the online self-paced boot camps, which we've launched two already last week or week before, um, which is like the basics of no code and then building projects. So the basics is like there are five different videos five different quizzes, five different projects, and then a fi final project. Like you're in a cohort of people, but it's a rolling cohort. So there's people coming in and out all the time. Um, and then we we mark things up and there's like scores and things like that to, to be able to pass. I think having structured um, <coughs> is more beneficial and like it helps people because when people just learn about no code, maybe find MakerPad and think, okay, there's like 150 tutorials here. Like where, like where, the, where do I start? Like what do I do first? Um, and if you look at platforms like Code Academy, right, for the probably the biggest learn to code platform, all of their courses around, they assume that you're actually starting from zero and going through like a process of going from zero to, to other things. So, I'm like really betting on 
that this structured online self-paced boot camps um, are the better option. And yeah, we're mm-hmm. going to be pushing forward on much more of these. And uh, yeah, this is that's definitely so. so they're, they're very much video based. Yeah, yeah, they're all they're still, they're all got a video with text accompanying them because we saw that once we started doing like live workshops like this, but we'd be, be doing like a, a guided project or something that yeah. people loved it. People was like, there's hundreds of people signing up. People are just like asking questions like they do here. And how can we bring that into like our community as the standard, but as like a rolling thing? So it's not just, okay, to t- today between four and five, because you've got to time everything for every time zone. And then it's like a pain for one person. So we're trying to have it as like, how do we figure out the whole online boot camp experience? And we're really going to try and focus on that. And we have built these two boot camps and everything is no code, obviously. And all the back end is all completely automated. So when you answer a quiz, that automatically gets added to Airtable and go through the processes. And then when you get to the end, when we've said, yep, yeah, this person has completed everything, you get a certificate, like emailed through and everything else. So you sort of get in these levels. So yeah, we're spending a lot of time now and effort on really trying to nail that experience um, mm-hmm. for our community. Hmm. I think that's something that's missing in, in education and especially with what you can build today, it's sort of game, gamifying the experience and making it almost like, a, I mean, we have one school in France it's called the 42. Um, and their curriculum is sort of like a video game um, and you have levels that you can reach uh, and you need to uh, obtain a certain level to graduate and there's stuff like that. And I think there's also um, a scrimba for coding, which is like a video cast, but that's interactive at any time you can stop and play around with what the person's doing. Um, and so sort of those new formats, I think there's a lot of stuff to be done there. Yeah, I mean, we're not trying to... Like there's lots of things that I've gotten carried away with, like learning to be a new founder and like just like trying to reinvent something. But they'll always come back to how do we make it simpler? How do we make it more like what's already out there? What do people recognize? Mm. How do people do things already and what already works out there? So as much as we're trying to do like new cool things, I'm also thinking, well, hang on a second. What's the, what are the things that actually work for learning and how do we apply mm-hmm. that in this, in this no-code realm? So, yeah, we're definitely – always uh always trying to improve that process that makes sense and you are one uh, have you made some adjustments to how you run your boot camps mm. that's uh, that's a bit different because um with alexi my co-founder what we want to do and um, in which we are experienced it that is face-to-face training uh, in real life you know uh like um presential trainings and that's how we began on different formats, very short formats, you know, to make discover and understand people, uh, one day formats and several weeks formats. And that's interesting because we apply what we, what I have still applied in education, you know, learning through practice, of course, but also showing people and letting, letting them struggle, letting, letting them search afterward. Uh, and that's so interesting because with coding, that was so complicated. You had here, you know, people uh, don't go desperate. You know, there is a point they have success. With coding, you, t- you can have four days without any success, you know, <laughs> when you begin to save a script and all. We had so, some students who cried, you know. Now here, that's cool. You can show and let them read the manual and touch and all, and they don't cry. So that's cool with no coding. And also... I think with no coding, at the, um, the what is at stake is making things, making projects. We always give many, many, many examples. Many examples of the entrepreneurial way of doing things, but also of uh, of the stack that was the best adapted to it. And uh, so we give examples like Comet, like Dualito, uh, we found on MakerPad, and uh, things like this. And what I have to say is that now... We have some trainings that work for people who want to train on, on no code or build things. And we have to, we want to go online. And that's really not the same stuff. Uh, we are digitizing it. I think our, our, convi- our conviction is that we know how to do things offline. So we will try to mimic this online mm-hmm. 
uh, to to have maybe that um, yeah that uh, that specificity. Uh, I think we can't uh, we don't have the experience some other actors have, and uh, I think we won't make many tutorials. I think that will be many uh, face to face online stuff, mm -hmm. uh, or uh, you know um, I think embodied um, embodied uh, online courses. And but, but, um, what what yeah. do you mean by that? I don't know. You know, um, I think uh, with no code, for example, uh, what works uh, offline is sometimes embodying stuff. You know, when you embody the database and then you act like your Zapier bringing okay. data. I think that's very material. You know, that's bricks and uh, and pipes. You know, that's uh, <laughs> Mario, Bro Mario Bros. Uh, yeah, yeah that's for sure. For sure. Make like it. You know. Yeah, and, but, but yeah, I mean, it. it's what we were saying before. Is the sort of drag and drop and sort of i i really see it like playing legos like picking the right breaks yeah. and stacking them in the right way um rather than sort of seeing lines of, of text that are, are making so far it physical you know yeah. yeah that's funny and you know you can see uh, the people who understand no code and the value of no code you know for example there was a student tamba he's um trained by les Determiné, you know that's um for android privileged uh people uh, mm -hmm. entrepreneurs but who have very much potential we have a one-day training where we build uh, Airbnb for bike, Airbnb bike with Weebly, Zapier, Airtable, level. And you know, when he understood something, when he had the success, he was standing up, he was like, wow, I did it. And, and you see, that's a maker to be, you know, that's a potential no coder. You know, that's not only in the brain, that's like a, a craftsman, you know. Mm -hmm. Do you think you're going to try and sort of mimic the Lambda School way and that type of live like live chatting live classes and things like that more of more of that than a like a self-serve because that, i mean that's the one thing that takes something for someone else to be way more valuable of like there is a live component where i get to see speak with people if i want to or like there's obviously the, there's a lot of people who when we did a live boot camp a live online boot camp like half the people just didn't turn up or do the projects. Some of them was just like, yeah, yeah, I'll do it in my own time. And then maybe never got around to it. Um, and then there's a few that like really liked getting on at that, at that time. But yeah, obviously we're trying to figure out some of that stuff too, but it's, it's interesting to see. And I think, did I, I don't know if there's some code in boot camps who have just said they're starting online. Um, I don't know. Of Blue Wagon, they're, they're in person, right? And they're... I mean, they all have to be, I think. Yeah. The the problem with the the, the wagon is um, it's a franchise model, so I don't know how that changes things okay. in terms of the sort of each franchisee would have to host their own session and have they have centralized tech. I'm not sure how it works, but I imagine most in person boot camps must be kind of figured out. Yeah, yeah, I mean this this whole thing that's going on now is pushing people to go and do things online quickly it doesn't mean that everyone's now going to stay online. like yeah. if but i think but i think it's going to I, I think it's forever going to change the way we work i mean a lot of people that refuse to see it online and are forced to do it and are seeing the pos the positive sides of it for, for sure we're going to go back to a less online way of, of, of working uh, yeah but it's gotta it's gotta change some some things yeah i think it will change some things but i think the worst like the worst way to convince someone that online is the best is saying you have no choice but to stay at home and get on a zoom call um but like hopefully no, for sure start looking into it and start thinking that zoom call could have been an email that email could have been a text for sure or, or all that sort I, of stuff hopefully comes out of this no of course mm -hmm. but i mean just if you look at us like we we are used to hosting offline events all the time and we've always wanted to grow out of our bubble and and start being better at online but offline was was going so well and taking so much time that it was hard to dedicate resources to it and then the current situation happens and the whole events team is now doing online events um and we're for sure gonna be better and making more online events after even if we go back to doing offline events and i think you can apply that to a lot of a lot of stuff like our, our design team they are used to all be in, a, in the same office and come to the office all the time 
uh, they've learned to work through Zoom and screen sharing, um, and they're actually much more efficient. Like and moreover, yeah, you have some tools, you know, sometimes you have some teachers in face to face that's in face to face, they move, but nobody understands anything. anything. But if you use a good tool on the good rhythm, for example, um, uh, we had an online training with a uh, high school um, students, mm -hmm. Dauphine now, and you be, we began by a Kahoot, you know, uh, a quiz asking at the beginning, in your opinion, can we do this with no code or not? And, you know, it made them think, it made them active, even if that, if that was at the end of the day. And sometimes online can be, can be more captivating than offline, I think, uh, because you're constrained by some things, but you also see some tools. You say, ah, I never tried it. And uh, how, how could, it, could it be useful? I think. I'm interested in how um, you said you've, you've worked with high school. Like what, what are the tools you teach them? Because that, I think, is one big thing in, in the no-code world is we get hit up every day about how can we help universities, schools, and other, other places to teach them how to do stuff without code. There was one, um, a teacher from middle school in, in America, and when we, we did a, uh, a Glide app workshop, and she just said that she was teaching her kids about some digital products and they just live streamed the workshop and she just like left it so that we did it. And it was like a real eye opener to say that like younger children are wanting this stuff. They are being taught some of this stuff. And then I was even thinking this, like what could we put on now that we could teach kids to build some stuff. But then I was like, I don't even know what the right tools are for that. You mm. almost need like a middle ground of, like some drag and drop elements a bit more fun and lego block like but that produce simple websites simple apps but not for learning to code but learning to like no code. Mm, to program mm. to, to build. when you think about it you know scratch the um, mit tool to learn how to program to kids that's a visual programming tool uh that's kind of a no code tool you know mm. and i think there are some uh, computer science tracks, I don't know if that's Princeton or Harvard, in computer science, they begin by scratch, yeah. you know? So <laughs> like beginning through no code so that they can learn code. I think for kids, there is really something interesting mm -hmm. in making them build things very young as if they build something yeah. with wood or I don't know. For what. sure. I think that's an interesting yeah, question. Apple no is doing it with uh, Swift UI as well. Um, and they, they're very much focused on, ki on kids. Who? Apple. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. So Swift, their programming language, um, they just launched a thing called Swift UI, where um, okay. where you build the UI, drag and drop, and then it generates code. Mm. Oh, okay. Louis is saying C CS50 at Harvard, start with Scratch. Mm. Okay. Oh, yeah, and, and Flat Iron uh, is a boot camp that's going online. Okay. So they're all going to see what, 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 they're, what they're doing. Um, all right. Um, so earlier we were talking about the, the different use cases um, for no code and so the the internal use case. Um, and I think there was a question earlier about corporate companies. Do you, do you guys have interest from from corporates to send their employees, uh, operational employees? To is that something that happens? A lot? Yeah. So we have a specific B2B tier, a business tier, we call it our startup program. Um, and our offering is custom training for teams, multiple seats, make better access, and you can hire vetted experts. So this is, like we, we used to have a lot of inbound from people saying, hey, can you build this thing, like build my product for me? <laughs> so we've changed, we've changed our page a few times and tried to say, by the way, this is not for this, like this is for training. Um, we really believe that that is gonna be a huge, huge thing for us um, and for this industry yeah. because yeah. like, it, but, but it takes a lot of, um, takes some convincing because people don't know what they don't know. Um, Education. If, like I've got to go and like painfully say to friends who run companies in America or whatever, say, oh, by the way, you know you can automate that and save loads of time and money and everything else 
And they're like, yeah, yeah, but maybe my developer will just do it one day. So like, there's still lots of education to be done here. So mm. a lot of our boot camps will be focusing around like, mm. we have like a sales boot camp. There's like five projects, like a salesperson would do. Here's some examples with no code. Um, so we're going to do stuff like that. But we've got um, workshops with some big companies coming up and, and big university incubators, which mm. is interesting in that like we can see that this interest is starting to come, especially now. Mm. It will be interesting, yeah, to see how uh, how much further it comes. Um, and so who, who do you talk to when you talk to a corporate? So I've got a... What, what very, department? I've got a very good team member who does all of that for me. Okay. So she's been, I think she's got, got a good network. Some of the startups I know just through my network. So a lot of it has been sort of people I know, the people I've reached out to anyway, but we've got some mm -hmm. of these workshops lined up with companies and universities through, through one of my, uh, one of my team. And what about you? Or when do you get to interest for corporate? Yeah, in uh, in our case, we are really entrepreneur, freelance, B two C oriented. But we like to work with um, corporates because we know how to do it for a long time on innovation, on education, and um, there are three three parts. I think there is the part like I'm a big company. I want to launch fast some experimental projects. So let's build it for me. We don't produce, we know experts on Bubble, on Webflow who produce very well. So we recommend them or we say to the company, let's think how you can make your project more lean and how we can coach you to produce it yourself. And the company answers, yes, very well. And then they are in a hurry and that's not so, so, so easy to educate to it, but we there are two cases in which uh, it, it begins to work so that's the i want to launch something fast profile second issue is we are using excel we are using sap we that's a fucking mess and we want to 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 have to be autonomous to change our tools and um, we want to train uh, uh, a shock squad to master for example airtable and that's a very interesting use case because uh, there are the people who say, but what is different from Excel and all the people who say, ah, really, you can do this? Really? You can do this in two clicks? So I want it. So training people to be more productive and uh, generally Airtable automation. And uh, what is good is to train some very, um, some very interested people, the core, and then all the other people to use the tool, uh, even if they don't create some uh, templates or not. And the third case is, I don't know what there is in no code, but I feel that's interesting. Just come and train our, um, our uh, employees or we send our employees to your class, to your B2C class, and let's see what it, what it gives. And um, yeah, we try to train corporate as we train our entrepreneurs, indeed. And uh, our part is a very technical part. And what is about growth hacking? Uh, uh, coaching like you do uh, in the family at all. We try not to do it ourselves, just a little part, but um, generally companies, yeah, there is this big work of education, of convincing, as mm -hmm. you said, Ben. That's that's the longest part. Yeah. <laughs> so they have to take. Yeah, yeah, there's, yeah. I think, see, like hearing you say those three different types is very accurate with, with what we see as well. Um, and yeah, there's just like a different avenue to take with a business. You've got to think differently with how they're trying to look at it and they're looking at it in terms of the solution rather than, I mean, they often don't care that it's no code. They just want to know like, Oh, can this person who sits in marketing do this thing faster? Um, so yeah, we've, yeah, we've got a lot of things to do there, but, uh, people are without it, using engineering. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. There's, so that we see a lot of like growth people at startups joining make pad. So people often come as like a first, step in and become the no-code champion of their company and they become oh my god i'm gonna tell everyone about this i just managed to do this thing so um that is like really helpful so we've got to think of ways to like really help like encourage that and enable them to go to their company and say this is what we should have like everyone should be on this yeah we've got a, like we've even got a a google doc template that says here's a letter to send to your boss and you just 
enter your name, you can like change a few things. Uh, we've got this that is why no code is game changing. <laughs> I mean, that is just a Google Doc, so yeah. call it what you will. But it, yeah, it's um, it's like yeah, and we've got that. And and one of the scenarios you mentioned was, oh yeah, we've got stuff on Excel, and we want to do like this extra thing. We've got ten spreadsheets across ten different departments, but there's no like one central place. Or it's yeah. companies like okay, we use Airtable. But like I don't know if I'm using it well. I've only got like I've got it. I've got it to a certain point. It does stuff. Yeah, cool. Like is that it? It's like well, no. We can take you to like the way way further than you thought was possible. Stuff of we can train you with Airtable, but also we can bring in this other tool that will help you do this thing. And once you start having that one, you like you start thinking, oh well, can we automate this thing or can we change this thing and and do that? So. What we're trying to figure out is like, yeah, how do we get to that one first? And like a lot of our mm. promotions are things like you come and sign up as a business, you get your first workshop free. Like we'll we'll tell you if we can be helpful. Like if we can't, there's no point in you signing up. Like if you come and say mm. we use like all these tools and we're not willing to change them, how do you help us? I say, mm. We won't. Good luck. Like this isn't this isn't gonna be right for you because we don't want to piss off customers or not be valuable. We've got to make sure that, oh, this is a company that uses Airtable. They're looking to migrate over to Webflow from WordPress. Yeah, this is like probably a really good time for us to chat. We can talk you through this and also level you up as you do the migration. Um, but yeah, we're trying to do what you said, Owen, which is like, we'll do the teaching bit. We don't want to do the building thing because it's better that you know how to do these things because they because yeah, then your team can always add to this, change it. The point is that if we build it, you're going to come to us again and say, can you change this button? The point is that you can change that button whenever you want to change that button. Like mm. With Alexi, we have run two web companies. Uh, for 10 years, we don't want to do this anymore, yeah. <laughs> really. But I think there are two steps. First step, empowering makers of no code, no code makers into big companies and big startups, yeah. I think. And second, why not empowering no-code CTOs tomorrow? You know, there is a feature to ship or a new product to test. Uh, do we develop it? Do we code it? Or do we try it, uh, test it with no-code? And then we build it mm -hmm. with uh, real code, you know? That can be really interesting. And Charles Thomas, the, co the founder of Comet, uh, we interviewed him on a podcast, on our podcast, Contournement. And uh, he says at the moment, now... All of my employees, I try to make them trained on no coding, on automation, so that they can be better than we are, uh, oh, the, the CEO, the CTO um, uh, on no code, so that they are so efficient. It gives a culture and um, a power into the, the company. I think every big startup or big company should make this training uh, <laughs> derogatory. Yeah, we had yeah, a company. Sure. Compulsory. We, we had a company who, uh, who was our first b2b company and they said well they've they've halted hiring for now but when they hire they're going to have like make bad membership is on the benefits and you must know webflow airtable zapier and you'll be trained through make for this stuff so <laughs> it's funny to see yeah no for sure I, there, there was one tweet that was like um it was a cto that was saying uh when when my product team started using no code tools i saw it as a threat and now i have two <laughs> now i have two development teams <laughs> because my product team can prototype and then I just have to build what works. And I think, personally, I think it's going to change the way we companies hire and sort of structure their, especially tech teams, um, because developers are so hard to, to find and um, and the, the bandwidth that they have is so badly used um, that at some point you, they're going to they're gonna realize that instead of building stuff that we're not sure is going to work, product teams can build it a functional product um, and then make it perfect later on by by building it with code. Yeah, I think it's and maybe your customer will build some bricks so that yeah. you build them. <laughs> and also, what about the teams who keep on bugging the developers, saying, "Oh, can you when you get a when you get five minutes, can you just build this small tool for me?" Which you can build yourself in actually five minutes, but for a developer to switch their thinking, take your project on, go through all the process. Like it's not ever worth their time, so it stays mm -hmm. in the backlog, and you can just avoid that by learning to to do stuff without code. 
And if you take out an intermediary, then you're you're keeping the sort of essence of what you're trying to build cleaner because every time you you try to communicate with someone, you lose a bit of nuance. I think. Yeah, yeah. It's funny to see what types of companies this will be the best for, because obviously there's like different levels. Bigger companies get paranoid about control and governance and security. Oh, no, I don't. I actually don't want my team to be able to like push something out live. But I think. So that's why I think like the startup world really lends itself well here because they can understand what it really is to get something quick out there validated and that like pushing stuff out is better than keeping stuff behind closed doors for months and months and then it failing. So yeah, we'll see we'll seeing that. All right, guys, if there's a last question from the audience, um, write it now because we're going to end this soon. Um, What's cool about this platform, Hopin, that we're on right now um, is that you can have different spaces. Um, so this is actually just a one hour event. And so we have the, just the stage, um, but you can, we're, we're building day long events. And uh, maybe you should check it out that one as well for, for your, because you can build oh, sort of more, more um, sort of like small Zoom rooms up to 20 people and you can have conversations. And, and there's also something that we really like, which is the networking area, which is like a chat with that. Um, Cause we used to have in our offline events, we used to have this moment before every event where we forced uh, the audience to talk to their neighbor. Um, and, and, it, and it became sort of like a real thing that we made at every single event. Um, and now we man we can do it online because there's this networking area that's like a chat roulette and you press on a button and you can match with a random person. Um, Okay. If, if you have, I just have to stay and uh, it will. Uh, uh, there's less. There are less couple questions, and then we can all head over there and 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 meet other people. Um, Louis is asking, is saying every startup should now build their landing page with Webflow, so the tech team does not have to be responsible to make the changes. And I think that's that's a no-brainer. Yeah. Um, and and like hmm. I even think now that the prettiest landing pages and the best landing pages that I see are built on Webflow. It's it's hard to yeah. to make something better than with code. Yeah, that, templates of yeah, that's where I struggle to go to a different platform because like I can't make anything look as good. I, I mean, I do that myself for my own platform, but I don't know. Like for me, anyway. Yeah. What you've done is very cool now, and make a better <laughs> But for beginners, people who are who are or just yeah, bootstrapping their startup and testing things, um, generally I recommend Weebly. Uh, that's very simple. That and I think that's rather cool. You're limited, of course, but for people who who will uh, who will resign after uh, ha half an hour, I think Weebly is very. You have a direct uh, result. Mm. Cool. Um, uh, cool. And uh, Tomika is asking. Oh, uh, so Mendix, we mentioned it briefly. Um, you yeah. Ben? I've not, you I've, not, I've not looked. I've not like. I've not played with it because it seems to be like a low code enterprise for citizen developers or whatever they call it. Um, so honestly, I haven't got a, I haven't got an opinion there because I haven't, I just haven't used it. So I can't help there, sorry. That's okay, dude. You can't, I can't say better, you know. You, you need to have a life. You can be trying out every single no good tool nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> what's the next step for you guys? For who? For Ben? What's what's the next step? Let's finish on this. What's the next step for Make a Bad? Lots more online boot camps. Like that, yeah, that's the piece we're going to try and figure out is structured online content for like building stuff without code. Um, that's it. And for contournement, what's the next step? For contournement, so as I said, we are very French centered, French centered, and French speaking centered. And uh, yeah, on our website, contournement.io. We have many online webinars, online trainings coming, side project training on some weeks. We try to put it online. So just subscribe if you're, if you're interested in it, into it, because I think B2B stuff after this period, we don't know what will happen. So for the moment, <laughs> very B2C. And um, another thing I talked about um, mobile app we developed for uh, Borlieu Santé. Uh, health in suburbs. Uh, it's called enmodeconfiné.org. Uh, we developed it with Glide and Airtable, uh, but that's a very, very uh, nice cause. You know, they help people, old people who are very poor, uh, and they translate videos in, into uh, la different languages, you know, uh, or in 
African languages, that all for people who don't speak French. And uh, so just go uh, on our Twitter, that all on modeconfiné.org, share it for the max so that people can help them. And normally we'll be on uh, Click TV uh, on replay tonight. So is that the show they so, host yeah, on that's Instagram? Our art uh, project. Is what? that the show they host on Instagram? Uh, Instagram, yeah, Twitter, uh, Facebook. So that's our whole project. No code for good. <laughs> cool. All right. Ben, everyone, thanks you so much for coming. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Hope everyone enjoyed the, the panel and uh, let's meet in the networking section. Have a good awesome. night, guys. Thank you, the family, for the event. Thank you, Rolando. Pleasure. Hey, 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 hey,